Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've been an organizer of Guruko for the whole time. This is our sixth year. I've been there every year. And I've never wanted to give a talk uh, here, actually. I've never had an idea that, that I thought was important enough. But I wanted to talk about this today. The title of my talk is The Front End Future. And I'm going to be talking about thick client web development, um, which is having a big impact on the web engineer engineering industry. Uh, and I actually think that here in the Ruby and Rails scene, we're not really talking about it enough. So I want to talk about it and help spur that discussion. Um, first, to start with just basic terms. Some don't, may not know the terms thin and thick client, but I'm pretty sure you understand the concepts. Thin client is a traditional server-side view in Ruby and Rails. Uh, the, uh, the server gets the request, renders the view in Ruby, and ships a big, chunky HTML page to the browser. That's, we've all done that, I'm sure. Uh, thick client is sort of this, the new hotness, right? Where some of us are starting to do this, where you've moved the view logic into the browser using JavaScript, often contained in a framework, like Backbone.js or Ember. And then the communication between the browser and the server is using a JSON, uh, JSON-based REST URL, uh, REST uh, interface. This, isn't a, this, is, this is a talk with technical aspects to it, but it is not a super nuts and bolts technical talk. It is much more macro. It is much more strategic, and we try to talk about the future, right? So I'm going to be talking about how you should think about thick client development when you're building a new product, uh, when you're running an engineering team, and when you're, perhaps most importantly, when you are steering your own personal engineering career. Uh, but first, a disclaimer. It's not really big enough. Uh, so a big disclaimer. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, and, and really none of us do. This is an exceptionally chaotic time in our industry. Uh, we're really just talking about probabilities, hedging bets, things that may happen, may not happen, but it's very difficult to know with certainty what the next couple of years look like. I don't think that is cause for pessimism. I think there's a lot of great stuff in that chaos, but we should be aware of it. So let's start first with your product. Is Thick Client right for your product? If you were starting a new web product today, would you do it on Thin Client or Thick Client? What are the reasons that you might do one or the other? Uh, there are lots of pros, lots of cons. Let's start with some cons. Uh, thick client development is inherently more complicated. The model of kind of dealing with all these fine grained events can be, is just going to be more work. So it's just going to be a little slower off the bat. Also, because we are very early in this, a lot of the practices and the libraries and the frameworks, we're still in the process of figuring them all out. You're going to, you're going to spend more time just doing basic stuff. Um, and accordingly, there is also heavy churn in libraries and frameworks. So if you pick Backbone or Angular or Ember, you will find, A, that the upgrade path will be much bumpier than if you were just doing server-side Rails, server-side views in, the rail, in Rails. Uh, you will also find that from time to time, you are much more likely to pick a framework or a little a smaller library that goes completely out of date, the maintainer gets tired of it, uh, they merge it into some other project. So it's just a bumpy path staying, staying in touch with the state of the art in, in, in the field. Uh, and testing is inherently harder. For unit testing, we have actually pretty good stuff now. Jasmine, I think, is not bad. Um, but for integration testing, that just sucks. And you're basically going to be using probably Selenium. Selenium is both an amazing feat of engineering and a giant pain in the ass, right? Like, it's, it, it does this insanely difficult thing, and it does it pretty well. Uh, and thank God we have it. But it's still just a real pain to write tests that go through it and have them repeat and run on the CI server and not break all the time in random. That's something you're going to have, have to own a lot more when you go to thick client. And there is this issue of first page load speed. So what does that mean? This is the diagram I showed you a minute ago of the thin client versus the thick client, but it's not really the whole picture, right? Because when you first start, the thick client has to bootstrap. It has to ship all this stuff into the browser, all this extra JavaScript code, code all these templates. The browser has to load it and get ready, and then you show you something. That's why when you open up Gmail, they give you that progress bar, and it takes a couple of seconds. Now, it turns out in the case of Gmail, it doesn't really matter. It's worth the trade-off, right? Because people open Gmail up, and they leave it open for days or longer. Um, but a lot of this has, you know, this is very specific to what application you're doing. What percentage of your page views are first time? If you're not doing something like Gmail, if people come in for a couple of page views and bounce, then that bootstrapping phase might actually be a serious problem. Twitter.com is a very good example of this. Uh, last year, they rolled out their website and made a very, very thick client. And since then, they've actually been reevaluating in very surgical ways. And they very recently rolled back their status URL, their tweets URL. So a year ago, you would hit it, and it would be hash bang, Guruko status, whatever. So that was, first you'd have to bootstrap the Twitter.com thick client application, most of it, or all of it, I don't know. 
and then you would see the tweet. And they blogged about it. They said, well, we're seeing a lot of people come in from the outside. They haven't loaded this. And so it's, we decided to optimize in the other direction. And, and they serve you now just HTML. If you curl this URL, you'll get the same thing that the browser sees. In a similar vein, there is this issue of crawlability, which is to say that search engines, that's pretty much Google, though there are others, right? They do very little to deal with Ajax uh, because it's really hard for them. Um, so if you make a public site and you make all these beautiful public pages and you have them accessible through Backbone or Ember, you probably can't see them in, when you search for them in Google. Now, Google, a little while ago, last year, released this sort of pseudo spec where they said, hey, guys, let's try this. Right? We'll do this hash bang key equals value. And if the Googlebots see that, they're going to try to pass a full URL uh, before the hash that says question mark, escape fragment, equals key equals value. To which, basically, the entire web engineering community reacted like a baby tasting a lemon for the first time, because <laughs> that's hideous. Right? It's ugly. It's like the worst thing you've ever seen. And Google wasn't even arguing that point. They weren't saying it was elegant or beautiful or whatever. They're like, yeah, it's pretty awful, guys, but it's what we've got. And you know what's funny is I just found this out a little while ago. Um, somebody, like six weeks ago, this was on Post, and this is front page Hacker News stuff, um, was curling, like, scanning through their own logs and seeing Google bots kind of like do stuff that implied that they were trying to figure out Ajax. Now, I, I'm not going to go through this guy's logic. But he said, based on the way he knows his website works, that one went after the other means that Googlebots are trying to do Ajax. He's probably right. There's probably some experiments going on. I'm sure Google is doing like a thousand experiments at once. Experiments at once. But if you if you get to the point where you're basically crawling your logs to figure out what Googlebot does, not because somebody Google says so, but because you're basically like trying to do forensics or trying to hear if Martians are talking to you across outer space, that's probably not a good way to make a bet about the future crawlability of your thick client application. This stuff can be done in theory, right? Like web browsers are just software. You could write this all in the, in the, you could do this all in the server. There's stuff like PhantomJS and Headless Selenium and blah, 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 right? But the problem is that if you're Google, these problems get way more complicated. If you have to serve, if you have to index 50 billion unique web pages and keep them up to date all the time, you're going to be very reluctant. So they have been very quiet about their sort of future JavaScript plans, I don't think it would be a smart idea for anybody to assume this problem gets solved easily soon. So you know, that's, I think that's one reason why GitHub, uh, which you know, is a pretty great website experience, among other things, uh, GitHub doesn't do anything that's called, that would be considered a thick client. They do some very great, very surgical, partial Ajaxy stuff. But pretty much every URL you see in GitHub, you can hit with curl. And I don't, I don't know if they've talked about this much, but it makes perfect sense, right? Like, they host a ton of open source projects. You have to be able to find GitHub stuff uh, on Google. So there's lots of cons, but there are many, many, many pros as well to Fed Um Let's talk about those. The first one is that REST is actually awesome. Um, and I don't think a lot of us are even doing that much of it and really have really had enough time to sort of like absorb all the ways that it's actually really a great way. Now, it's definitely a decoupling. Decoupling isn't free. But if you have to do it anyway, you might find all these benefits. And a lot of you do have to do it anyway. So in this room, raise your hand. I'm just really curious. Who here is working on a website or server software where the primary user interface is mobile devices and not a web browser? OK. Well, shit. That's like a quarter of the room, maybe. All right. So this is, this is a big part of computing today, right? It's very common to be on a new product and you say, actually, we launched to iPhone first. And the web browser is like three static pages that we're doing in Jekyll, or God knows what. It doesn't matter, right? Or maybe you have both. So you're supporting multiple devices. It's a very common use case. Um, now, so if you're doing, let's say you're doing this and you're launching a, now, you know, sorry, in the past, if you did this a couple of years ago, especially before Backbone and Ember, you would probably would have done it this way. We're off on the left-hand side. You would have the browser connecting to the server using the very traditional server-side Ruby and Rails chain. Right? You generate the view in, on the server, and you ship HTML. And off to the right, when you're talking to your Motorola StarTac and your Zune, uh, you'd have standalone API controllers that would ship JSON out to these clients. That Often these clients can't even, don't even know what to do with HTML, or they have to create some web view component inside the native thing. And it's a giant pain in the ass for everybody. Of course, it's really obvious what the problem with this is, right? You have basically the same logic living on the server in two places. You have the view 
off to the side. You have the HTML logic and the JSON object, but the JSON logic, but they're doing a lot of the same things. There are probably engineering teams that are disciplined enough to live in this structure without duplicating code. You do not work on that team. <laughs> and so if you were to do this today, you might just say, screw it, let's keep things simple, right? We're gonna ship the view into the browser using a thick client application framework, and then we're gonna have everything go through one set of controllers. So we're gonna reduce our chances to get in our own ways by repeating logic. There's other great things you get through REST. You get, you get to use HTTP in a very full way. And there are lots of things living between browser and the Rails, like a CDN or a load, ba load balancer or rack. All of these things can speak HTTP natively without caring what's even on the server. You can use this for caching. There's a lot of pretty good stuff in the protocol now. Um, and if you design your REST, you, or your REST API well, uh, your get URLs are really great cache keys. You also get better parallelization. And this actually hits a lot of people. I don't think they really know it. Um, it's really common in Rails when you're doing server-side views to generate, a, to, to render a bunch of stuff, and you can't send anything to the client until the whole thing is done. And you might be loading a bunch of stuff, and now you've got a request that maybe takes two seconds, right? The biggest culprit in this actually is not the database. Everyone, like, worries about the database, and definitely you have to keep an eye on it. But when you're starting, the biggest absolute culprit is Active Record, because Active Record is awesome, and it does all the stuff for you, but the cost of that is instantiating Active Record objects can be very expensive. Um, especially if you're not modifying them at all. But if you figure out how to break this down into multiple different requests, and you do JSON calls, you learn how to, you will have to learn about jQuery promises, which are worth it, I promise. Uh, uh, and then you can break it down into multiple requests. Those can be three requests that take a second or a half a second, and you get the page to the user faster. And there's this other issue of decoupling side effects with user flow, uh, which actually, connects to Matt's talk in interesting ways that I didn't anticipate, but I think we've been doing this in our Rails controllers for so long we've forgotten how kind of weird and broken it is. Everyone's written code like this in Rails, but you're doing two very different things. You're saving stuff to the database using whatever domain logic is wrapped around that aspect, and then you're sending a redirect if it was successful. Why are they in the same place? It doesn't make any sense. They're, they're so barely related. And then you felt the pain if you've ever had to do complex redirect logic, and later, a week later, you come back to that action, and you say, I can't even see what this thing is doing. What is, why did I have to put this case statement here? Now, you can abstract that away in another thing, but it still doesn't change the fundamental fact. With a nice REST, URI, REST API, you get that separation of concerns. And you tell the view, it is your job, I don't care. All I do is take parameters, and I try to do something with it, and then I tell you how it went. And you can render this page or that page or not render a new page at all. Um, and in fact, this is just much cleaner. And one of the things I'm looking forward to, which I don't think has happened a lot, but I think will happen very soon, people are gonna realize you can do A-B tests if you ever have an A-B test where the flow changes based on what test population the user is in, this is gonna make this 10 times nicer. Because you're not gonna have to litter your controller code with if test population A, B, whatever, it's, it can all live in the view object. But this really, speed is really the biggest reason to go for thick client. And when we talk about speed in the user experience, we're not talking about giving users the feeling that they're driving a race car that's going down a track at 100 miles an hour. That's not what they want. We are talking about a website that responds to their actions so quickly that they forget that they're using software. We talking, we're talking about something where they can remember and focus on the task itself, and our software becomes invisible. Jacob Nielsen is uh, one of the godfathers of web usability, and he wrote about this. He said that at 0.1 seconds, that's about, the, that's about when users feel that the system is reacting instantaneously. Uh, at one second, they notice the delay, but they can still keep their train of thought. And then at 10 seconds, you're going to have a really hard time keeping them even remembering what it is they're trying to do. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about this, we're just talking about times, we, make, we get no excuses for the fact that we're trying to ship everything over the network. Right? This is the entire cycle. The user clicks, the browser sends the request out across the network, hopefully not too far. The server gets it. So you're not just talking about server time in the Rails log. You're talking about the whole cycle. And when do you think he wrote this? When do you think he set these insanely high expectations? You said them in 1993, almost 20 years ago. And this wasn't even in research at the time. This was HCI research he was citing that was pretty uncontroversial. It comes from 1968. Because people really haven't changed. I mean, computers are just catching up to them. And so what do you think we did with Jacob Nielsen's very interesting analysis back then, right? We were like, oh, that's really great. Thanks for looking that up for us. And then we hid these numbers away like, like a deformed relative in the basement. 
because they were impossible. Because they were completely and totally impossible, and all they did was remind us of how badly we sucked at our jobs. Right? But it's been 20 years. And we're getting closer. The web gets faster. Hosting options like EC2 and Heroku uh, make it easier for us to scale out. Uh, Server-side storage improves both SQL and NoSQL and whatever. Server-side caching, web servers, load balancers, all of these things have improved. HTTP and other protocols have actually moved forward in 20 years. CDNs get faster, and our, your end user devices, uh, which is what we are all using to bring the Wi-Fi down today, the, 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 those all improve as well. Fit client is part of this story. Because once you've gone past that bootstrapping phase, there's a lot of things that are just faster and more responsive. JSON is almost always faster to ship than HTML that's been pre-rendered, especially because when you're doing a pre-rendered collection, you look in there, it's all these divs and all this duplicated stuff, all these CSS classes all over the place. Some view changes don't require any server interaction at all. Sometimes you've already loaded that data and you can just reshow it to them in a different, different arrangement visually. Sometimes someone's looking at a user profile and they want to send that person a message. You don't need to load a form. They haven't written anything. There's no data at all. It's just the shell of a message in a form template. And there's this concept of optimistic server interactions, uh, which is this sort of new idea where people are playing around with the concept that if I make a post to the server and I expect it to always succeed unless there's an actual outage, I'm just going to tell you it already worked. I'm going to lie and then maybe 0.1% of the time or 1% of the time when Heroku's down, I'm going to say, whoops, I take it back, right? So this is, this is all, we're all moving forward with this. We're making a web, a web that's faster. A web that has been slow for so long that we've forgotten how shitty that is for people. And we're making it, we're just about getting ready to make it fast enough for people to really like it. So I think we sh that's the biggest reason to do it. So we can take our deformed relative out of the basement and get a little sun, hang out with Chunk. He loves Chunk. Um, Future-proofing is another reason. And future-proofing is often a bad word because it's often an excuse to overanalyze something. It's an excuse to like, write a lot of diagrams before you write any code. It's an excuse to write a lot of code before you release anything. But there is also future-proofing sometimes because there are changes that are difficult to make once you've been rolling. Right? If you make a Ruby and Rails app and a year later you want to switch it to Django, you don't have that option, really. You know, if you put 100 gigs of data into your MySQL database and then you decide you like Postgres better, that's too bad. And what about thin client to thick client? We don't really know. The, the jury is out on this one. I think we're in the process of discovering this as an industry. If you have a thin client application and then you decide and then you change your mind and you want to move, how hard is that? We don't really know. I think it's pre pretty hard. Uh, and I think it's a choice that you would rather avoid. What are, what are the consequences of making the wrong choice? Well, there's a couple, right? Number one is the technological advantage consequence. A year doesn't necessarily buy you mu that much, depending. Um, if you today are just about to do something in Backbone, and then you think to yourself, well, it's not quite productive enough, and it's going to really suck for the first couple of months, that's probably not the right reason to not do it. Because in a year from now, Backbone's totally going to be better. All of these frameworks will be better. And someone else will come in and do something exactly what you've done, like, like what you've done in Backbone. And then you'll have to figure out how to compete with that. In a similar sense, there is a recruiting issue. Because I actually think, and this is a, maybe a bold claim, but I think that we are looking at a future. Uh, there's going to be a point in the future where some of your talented prospects are going to see that you're doing server-side views. And it's going to make them a little less likely to work for you. That's not all of them at all. Uh, and there are many reasons that a person will or won't work for a technical company, but the war for tech talent is always fierce. I don't think that's ever going to get better. So that dovetails into the second thing, which is whether or not thick client is right for your team, which is a very big question that you have to uh, account for very honestly. Um, the, the hiring thing, which I just mentioned, I think it ends up being a bit of a wash. Obviously, you, it's very, very hard to find people with experience, but you don't necessarily need to have people with experience uh, in the sense that you're inexperienced programmers will be about as inexperienced as anybody else. Uh, you also probably, there are some people who will be more likely to work for you uh, because they get to do this kind of stuff. In a broader sense, there's this question of whether or not your organization can support cutting edge technology. I mean, I think for a lot of you, this question is solved, but uh, maybe not for everybody in this room. Um, there is nothing wrong with being at a company that does technology in a way that is further back on the risk curve. Uh, but you should know where you are, and not just not just what do I personally like, but what does my organization need? Right? And what, or, what behaviors can it support? Can you actually hire an aptitude as much as experience? Do you know how to evaluate? Do you know how to correct those mistakes quickly if you make them? If you make them? 
Can you invest in an engineering culture? Are people outside of the engineering team tolerant of the time it might take to invest in that engineering culture? Can you support engineers individually as they learn? Can you support the team collectively as it grows its own conventions? And this last one is actually a big deal. Rails really spoiled us when it came to conventions. When it came to all the different little trivial group decisions it took out of our hands, uh, it really made things much easier. Um, but if you look at, say, like, whenever I talk to people about backbone development, I think to myself, this is probably what it's like to work in PHP. Like, there are many different PHP companies. They all do it differently. And any, any PHP company that does it at all well does it because they've been, like, completely fascistic about, like, defining their team convention, not the PHP convention, and living with it. So if you're doing backbone, for example, you're going to have to do that. Now, Ember actually is a very interesting counter case, uh, which may save you that trouble. Uh, we, we'll see. But really, you need to think, what kind of engineering does your organization need? You know, it's not fatal to decide you're, yes, you're a very, you're very cutting-edge uh, cutting technology team, and you will like, live and die by that. It's also just fine to step back and say, we, don't, we can't do this right now, and we're just going to kind of do it a little more slowly, and then we'll kind of take the pros and cons of that. It's bad to think you're one and actually be the other. The third section is about your career. What, is this, what does this mean for you as a, as a Ruby programmer, maybe a Rails programmer? Uh, and this is the pretty philosophical part of the talk, so I'll start with a couple of quotes. The first one is this quote, it is better to be lucky than good, uh, attributed often to Lamar Gillett, who was a World War II pilot, a man who probably had a lot of reason to think about luck. Uh, it's an old sentiment, though, right? You can find it elsewhere. You can find it in Ecclesiastes, even. But the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, et cetera, et cetera. It ends with time and chance happen to them all. Um, so why do I bring up luck? I bring up luck because a lot of people in this room, uh, and including a lot of my personal friends in the industry, and including myself, really benefited immensely from being in the right place at the right time. When Ruby and Rails kind of like took this like crazy upward trajectory and seized a place at, at, in the engineering business in a permanent, close to permanent place, we benefited immensely. Our economic leverage kind of grew, and we turned that into other things. We got better jobs. We, we got better organizational experience. We started our own company. Some of us just worked part-time from Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> this was great. But you need to be conscious of how much of your own success is based on the things you did and how much is based on these broader factors that you didn't control. I would love to think that my whatever success I have is because I'm brilliant and really hardworking, and also devilishly handsome. But uh, I'm probably just kind of smart and kind of hardworking. And uh, we don't need to talk about my looks. So this is Ruby now. And this is the GitHub top languages graph. Uh, JavaScript has been ahead of Ruby, I think, for two years now. Now, it's, it is not at all a given that that this means that there will be more JavaScript jobs than Ruby in the future. I don't think that's, that's all given, but I think it is a factor. Um, and I also think that this is probably where certain kinds of teams are going to be shifting in terms of their resource allocation. Right? If you can imagine this as the proportion of jobs in an engineering company, or you can even imagine it as the number of hours, the way that an engineer would be asked to spend her hours in a week. Right? This is in a standard web stack. Obviously, there are other kinds of engineering work in the world. JavaScript Rails, by Rails I'm really meaning server-side business logic uh, in Ruby and Rails, analytics, anything complex involving data, medium size or large quantities of data, and then ops, right? I think Rails is going to shrink, period. I think that, and I think that the JavaScript part and the analytics part and the ops part are all going to grow a bit to sort of take up some of the slack. And to some extent, this is a sign of success. Because, because I actually think that if you wanted to solve server-side business logic on a web application, Ruby and Rails might be the best way that human beings can ever invent. Seriously. I mean, it's close to, I think. right? But it also means that that efficiency means that things get allocated elsewhere. It's not like most businesses, if you say, oh, yeah, I did your business logic in half the time, they say, oh, I need twice as much business logic now. right? Instead, they say, OK, let's allocate resources to these other areas where we're going to try to compete and get more gains out of it. And of course, JavaScript is what I'm talking about today. But these other two areas are also represented by significant trends in the computing world. Analytics is also big data, right? And ops obviously gets represented by the DevOps movement. So we're looking at a future where like, the straight up Ruby engineer has a little less to do 
I don't, for the record, I think this number is never going to zero. I think Ruby's an amazing language. I mean, I would hope I would think that. <laughs> God, that'd be depressing if I changed my mind on that one. Um, I think Ruby is an amazing language. And I think if you're on the server, you should, if for, for the vast majority of things, you want to do it there. Um, and this is not a gloom and doom talk. This is a talk about sort of a change, a shifting in the future, but it's not about the ending of this specific uh, kind of craftsmanship. And I wanted to address what I'm calling sort of thick client myths. Uh, computing always has a lot of crazy ideas floating around, which is part of what makes it so great. Um, but at exceptionally chaotic times, those crazy ideas start to seem a little less crazy. So let's talk about them specifically. First of all is this idea that now that we have a programming language in the client, we barely need server code at all anymore. Some people say this. It's a very interesting idea. I think it happens to be wrong. But what's happening is you're getting people who are noticing over here in the browser, they're spending a lot of time writing JavaScript. And over here in the data store, if they're using something like Couch or Mongo, they're spending a lot of time writing JavaScript. Right? There are now these data stores that speak JavaScript pretty much natively. And in between, you have the server. And so there's people who are asking, well, what's the point of even having the server at all? Wouldn't my life be simpler if I could talk almost transparently to the data store? The most recent example of this is Meteor.js. Uh, apologies, that is a terrible screenshot. I know. It's a, it's a screen capture of their Vimeo screencast, which blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so Meteor launched a little while ago, and it does this stuff really natively. By the way, for the record, Meteor.js is kind of awesome. There's a lot of amazing ideas in it, and I think it's absolutely worth checking out, even if you never try to build anything in it, but just sort of like reading the docs, watching this. This screencast is actually sort of amazing. But I think this idea happens to be wrong. So it's probably impossible for anybody to read, but really what's happening is this is a JavaScript console that's open on a Meteor, on a Meteor website. And in JavaScript, it's calling colors.insert name red, colors.insert name blue, and then name green. So it's basically sending these commands, JavaScript commands, over HTTP to the server. They've written no custom server code. And the server basically drops it right into Mongo. So you know, this is a provocative idea. And the Meteor guys are going to do their best to prove that it's right. I think they are very smart people. But I don't think that's going to overcome the fact that this idea is very difficult to do. Service, we have server-side code for a lot of real reasons. Uh, for one thing, there's the language agnosticism of supporting different kinds of clients. I have no idea how iOS talks to Meteor, you know, and short of like writing some Objective-C to JavaScript bridge, which I, I'm not doing that. You could do that. Um, there's also a real-world permission issue, which is not small. But we're not, by permissions, we're not just talking about, like, oh, I'm logged in now. Right? We're talking about your entire universe of objects and whether or not you can see them, whether or not you can see they even exist at all whether or not you can edit them, how you can edit them, in, what, in what, what conditions will your editability of these things change, can you delete them? Someone shares a photo, who can see that photo? Who can delete that photo? Who can tag it? Who can delete tags on that photo? Who can, who can tag their friends in that photo? All of these things, this logic is always really complicated and is always extremely specific. And in fact, it's kind of the core of the reason your product exists. You can't put it on the client because it'll be subverted. You can't put it in the data store well, you could put it in the data store, but then you're writing stored procedures in Mongo, so congratulations. Um, <laughs> you should put it in the server. Uh, also, in a, similar, in a similar vein, servers hide complexity because it turns out a lot of our jobs is just like wiring together crap that has to be wired together, right? It's hard enough writing client code with having to worry about whether or not this, this request sends emails directly or they send them through a background worker. Why would you want to deal with that in your web browser? That's insane. Uh, and in a similar sense, it centralizes application logic. A RESTful API is a set of contracts that you are basically offering to clients. And you say, I don't care if you're an iOS app, an Android app, or a website. You make a post to this URL, and if I tell you succeeded, that means I save this thing in the database, and I send an email, and you don't have to worry about how I did that. And in, in, in a second note, there is this, which is that it is a major win to be able to use the same language on the server and in the client. Uh, there are some people who say this. Uh, some of them are Node.js people. Not, not all Node.js people say this, and there is a lot of really interesting work happening inside of Node.js. But from what I can tell, this is not the reason to use Node. Because if you accept what I just said two slides ago, that it's important to have custom server-side code, and it's, it's also similarly that abstraction which prevents you from storing, from sharing a computing context shared method calls, things like that, then you've basically accepted this world where you're going to be talking to the server using protocols. It used to be HTTP and HTML. Now it's HTTP and JSON. 
Uh, but it means that the browser doesn't need to worry about what the client, the server's running. And if you wanted to use Node, if it happens to be best for you for that particular case, then you should use Node. But if you like Rails for the case, you should use Rails too. So in the case of Rails, there is movement happening in a thick client area. Uh, there's obviously some, you know, there's, I think there could be a little more, but that's fine. Yehuda Katz gave a really great no, uh, keynote this year at RailsConf, uh, where he talks, his talk overlaps with this talk to some extent, uh, but it's much more Rails specific. Uh, it's absolutely worth watching. Yehuda is always a great speaker, of course. Um, in, in terms of tech projects, there is uh, open source projects, there's the Rails API project, which is a way that you can take a new Rails application and then immediately strip out anything that has to do with service side views. Uh, and then there's active model serializers, which is part of a convention that Yehuda and a couple of other people are trying to like build, kind of build consensus around, which is these very simplistic ways to have everybody agree on how models get serialized into JSON. Do you, lead, do you use that leading node thing or not? Do you use, how do you do associations, blah, blah, blah. So there's some stuff happening in Rails, but I actually think, given, given the importance of this movement, now I don't think every website will be thick client in a couple of years. I think there are lots of good reasons not to do it, but I think that there are technical reasons that we have not dived into this fully, and there are also other reasons. And when I, when I started preparing this talk, I started thinking a lot about, I, I think that our hesitation is disproportionate to the technical issues. And I started thinking a lot about my own history as a Ruby programmer, uh, and the things I got out of it, and why I might hesitate, or why someone like me might hesitate. Um, the crazy thing is that I've programmed Ruby professionally for a decade, which is insane. Uh, but if I think back to when I first got excited about it, of course, there was the language, right? I, I had that newbie experience of seeing method missing, and this light, light bulb just went off in my head. I was like, oh my god, you can do all this stuff with a language? Now, some of you are saying, well, if you'd only done small talk, you would've, wouldn't have been so new, but whatever. I didn't do small talk. This is my introduction to these ideas. And I was psyched, right? I was just, like, amazed. And then there was the community. So the first time I went to RubyConf was in 2003 in Austin, Texas. There were literally, there were 30 people in the room uh, all weekend long. Um, and that was a great experience for me. And then, of course, there was the job market, which makes it all economically viable for me to keep doing this for a living. But when I think about why Ruby and Rails succeeded, which actually is kind of, for me, the same as like why I loved it in the first place, um, it's, it's really about the values, right? It's a dynamic, object-oriented language, and I happen to believe that for the vast majority of computing problems there are, a dynamic object-oriented language is the way to do it. Uh, we believe in consensus building around best practices. This is much more a Rails practice than a Ruby practice, and we have DHH to thank for that. But over time, it leaked into the Ruby world as well, and I think that's been good. Uh, we believe in agile practices, especially testing. Uh, we believe in the value of elegance. Uh, and we believe in niceness. Uh, Min Swan, which stands for Matt's is nice, so we are nice. Uh, sometimes we're actually better than others at actually being nice, but we state it as an ideal, which I think counts for a lot. Not everyone does that. And when I think to myself, where do those values live in the language, in the, in the, in the community, in the job market? Well, it's certainly not in the job market, right? Um, and it is to some extent in the language, of course, but you can actually use Ruby, the language, in ways that are in contradiction with these values. It's really in the community. So when I think about my experiences, and I have very strong memories of like, uh, that first RubyConf that I went to, because I've, I've had my ups and downs in the software engineering business, and, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, if, if it weren't for Ruby, uh, and I think Rails, to be fair, if it weren't for Ruby and Rails, uh, I'm not sure I would be an engineer today. You know, I think I, meant, I would be mentally capable of it, but I don't know if it would make me happy enough. Um, and the, the, the overriding feeling I took out of being at that first RubyConf in Austin was the feeling of being in a room with 30 smart and nice people uh, who shared a lot of these same ideas and being reminded that I wasn't crazy, that there was a way to write code that was both elegant and beautiful and also impactful, that you could actually deploy the stuff and it would actually have an impact in the world and you could make a living at it, all that stuff. Um, and after Austin, I went back home and I participated even more in the community in mailing lists and blogs and open source projects. We stayed in touch. We, we, we reinforced these ideas in each other. We refined them. We debated them. And then we set out to prove them right in the world, and we succeeded. So what about the JavaScript community? So it turns out JavaScript doesn't even have a logo, which is probably as it's probably as good a sign of any of what the JavaScript community means, which is to say it's a very amorphously divine thing. 
There are many JavaScript programmers. A lot of them, by the way, are brilliant, nice, hardworking people. But when you, even today, with all of its growth, if you say, I am a Ruby programmer, that usually means a certain set of values and practices, hopefully good ones, right? But it means something. But if you say, I am a JavaScript programmer, all it means is that you type into a keyboard and JavaScript comes out. It doesn't actually mean anything about, right, JavaScript programmers include, like, Yehuda Katz is a JavaScript programmer, and Jeremy Ashkenaz is a JavaScript programmer, mad smart programmers who are dealing with some really intense theoretical stuff, and some person who just, like, does a little bit of front-end work and knows a bunch of jQuery plugins, also a JavaScript programmer. There is a huge range. It means very little. So I actually think that part of our hesitation has to do with some of us are starting to do a little more JavaScript now, and we're stepping out into that world. We're spending more time on mailing lists and project, officers' projects, meetups, conferences, and we don't get that feeling at all from there that we, ha that we had here. But when you look at the core of it, when you look at the language, which is good, I mean, not as good as Ruby, but it's good, and you look at the browser environment, which is like shitty, but you can work with it, right? There is nothing on a technical level, there is nothing in here that makes these values impossible. We can do all of them here. So first of all, dynamic object orientation. And by the way, we should thank our lucky stars that it's JavaScript that won in the browser and not PHP, Perl, Java, Cold Fusion. Can you imagine Cold Fusion today, right? So JavaScript is a dynamic or object oriented language. We can put these other practices, which are largely about sort of culture, we can put them into our JavaScript practice somehow, but it's gonna be work. So that's actually the biggest message I want you to take away from today, that the tools will change, but your values don't have to. You can, but, but it's gonna be work, right? And that's one of the biggest things, is you go out into the JavaScript world to some extent, 10% of your time, 25% of your time, 50% of your time, you will not have those values that are waiting for you, not as easily accessible. But, but, but you should be looking to be active about finding them and encouraging them in that work somehow. You should go out, you should look to the left and to the right and see if there are other people who, who feel the same way. Some of them are going to be Rubyists like you. Um, and you should make friends. Because, no, <laughs> <clears throat> because no matter what the tools are, it, it doesn't change, it doesn't really change our business. It doesn't really change the fact that you should be able to do your work in a way that feels genuine, in a way that feels true to you. That's my talk. Uh, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>